WWF WrestleMania 14 took place in Boston, Massachusetts on the 29th of March 1998, attracting 19,000 fans to the Boston Fleet Center and bringing in an estimated 730,000 pay-per-view buys, setting a new record for the WWF in the 90s and just beating WCW's Starcade 1997 event a few months prior. Fans were tuning in to see a long-awaited battle between The Undertaker and Kane, a dumpster match featuring Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie versus the New Age Outlaws, and fans were also hoping that Stone Cold Steve Austin could become WWF Champion for the very first time when he battles Shawn Michaels in the main event. WrestleMania 14 would turn out to be a pivotal pay-per-view of the Monday Night War, another evolution of WWF takes place following this very show, so let's see what happened in Boston and let's see if fans got their money's worth. This is WWF WrestleMania 14. No matches took place on the free for all event. Paul Bear got interviewed and he talked about Taker getting sent back to the dark side and never returning. The lights began flickering during the interview, signaling that The Undertaker was close by. Michael Cole got ripped apart by Triple H for knocking on DX's door, but Cole did get an interview with Hunter and Mike Tyson. Hunter says DX promised that this would be an X rated WrestleMania, and because it's live on pay per view, anything could happen. It starts with Owen Hart and it ends with Stone Cold Steve Austin and Mike Tyson says Austin's going down tonight in the main event. The pay-per-view begins, Chris Warren and the DX band are in the arena and they're gonna sing their rendition of the Star Spangled Banner in America the Beautiful. It's an alternative mashup that the fans absolutely hated and the WWE have decided to completely cut this out of the network version of WrestleMania. JR says it's all about freedom of expression but I guess that freedom has been retconned as WWE want you to forget that this ever took place. And look, even if you think it sucks, it still gets the Generation X some heat. Jim Johnson's here too by the way, playing guitar in the DX band. The main pay per view opens up and we're going to start with a 15 team battle royal. If one guy gets eliminated, then that guy's team gets eliminated. The winners become the number one contenders for the tag team titles. All the tag teams are already surrounding the ring except Farouk and Kama. And just as JR and King were welcoming fans to the show, the beginning of LOD's theme music begins to play. Sonny walks to the ring with Hawk and Animal and the Road Warriors have a new look as they make their way down to the ring. Quick side note, they do not get introduced as LOD 2000 here, but that's what this updated version of the Road Warriors would eventually become known as. We can talk about this decision all day and fans do look back at this while rolling their eyes, but fans in the arena at WrestleMania are going absolutely crazy. Some other tag teams we have in this match include the new Midnight Express, the Quebecers, the first pairing of Brian Christopher and Scott Taylor is too much, the Rock and Roll Express, Steve Motherfucking Blackman and Flash Funk, but the outcome of this one was a foregone conclusion when Hawk and Animal made their entrance. Kurgan showed up to eliminate his old Truth Commission buddies, Barry Windham showed up to eliminate Chains and that meant Bradshaw also got eliminated. It came down to the Godwins, the New Midnights and the Road Warriors. The Godwins got eliminated but they came back in to hit Hawk and Animal with their slot buckets but this didn't stop LOD from winning the match. Bodacious Bard and Bombastic Bob get sent out last and the Legion of Doom become the number one contenders for the tag team titles. Hopefully things get explained on Raw though, last time we saw Hawk and Animal they were beating the hell out of each other so we need to know how they sorted out their issues. Maybe Sonny played Peacemaker? I don't know. Takamichi Noku defends the light heavyweight title against Aguila next and Aguila didn't even get his entrance aired on TV so we all know who's gonna win this one. Aguila pulls off an impressive arm drag, a head scissor takedown and a spinning wheel kick. There's already a few fans in the audience chanting boring and I really don't know what these fans expected to see when they bought their tickets. The action leaves the ring where Michinoku takes a baseball slide and Aguila performs a moonsault. Aguila tries to suplex Taka back in the ring but the champ manages to kick his opponent away and we see Taka's top rope dive to the outside, always good to see. Taka keeps the pressure on back in the ring with a few strikes in the corner and a low drop kick. Aguila replies with a series of arm drags, one from the top rope, one from a springboard and another from a top rope corkscrew. Taka ends up on the outside again and Aguila pulls off a fantastic corkscrew plancha. Inside the ring Michinoku misses a corkscrew moonsault, a lot of corkscrews in this match. Aguila lands his moonsault though but Taka kicks out at two. Aguila then gets smacked across the face for arguing with the referee. 
Michinoku splash from the top rope gets countered and Aguila continues to impress with a springboard hurricane rana while Taka was sitting on the top turnbuckle. Michinoku replies with a missile dropkick, he then signals for the Michinoku driver, Aguila counters but Taka has it scouted and we see a sit down powerbomb. Michinoku takes another chance and he misses another moonsault. He does manage to dropkick Aguila out of the air when the challenger comes off the top rope. We see that Michinoku driver in the match ends. Taka retains the light heavyweight championship. A good match here, but nothing we haven't seen before in previous light heavyweight matches. It doesn't really stand out among the others or anything, but it's still decent. Jennifer Flowers interviews The Rock, and Rock cuts her off for not addressing him as the people's champ. Jennifer wants to know what Rock would do if he was leading the country, and Rock says the term leader doesn't really fit. He prefers ruler. In regards to the homeless situation in America, as long as they keep their cardboard boxes off Rock's freshly mowed lawn, everything will be okay. In regards to the judicial system, the fan should remember that Rock is the judge and jury. A hung jury if you smell what the Rock's cooking. Jennifer then then wants to know how Rock would run the White House and the People's Champ says as long as the interns know their roles, they don't get out of hand and they don't do anything orally wrong then it's all good. If they do get out of line then The Rock will have no choice but to lay the smack down. Up next is the European Championship match, champion Triple H vs a one heart. China must be handcuffed to Sergeant Slaughter for this one. Triple H makes his way down to the ring with his new DX ring gear as the DX band play an instrumental version of Break It Down. Triple H now has some pyro too and it looks like WWF has put a bit more effort into Triple H's overall presentation. China doesn't want to get handcuffed but she has no choice, the ninth wonder of the world has been neutralised. The Blackheart gets a great ovation on his way to the ring, he brings Hunter to the mat right away with a double leg takedown followed by a few punches, Hunter gets backdropped and Owen hits Triple H with a few clotheslines. After a few mounted punches in the corner, Owen pulls off a Hurricane Rana but Triple H kicks out at two. The European champion fights back with a back elbow, Owen ends up on the outside where China tries to throw a punch at the challenger, Owen provokes China but he also sees Triple H coming and the champ takes a guardrail bump. Check out the security guy who got wiped out when Hunter fell on the guardrail. Back in the ring, Triple H avoids a sharpshooter by poking Owen in the eye. Hunter performs his facebreaker knee smash as Jerry Lawler wonders why Hunter isn't going after Owen's injured ankle. Owen then takes a clothesline followed by chops in the corner. Triple H lays the boots in and he tells Owen to suck it before performing the Harley Race knee. JR says here that Art Hebner is currently in an intensive care unit but he doesn't explain why. Turns out Art had a brain aneurysm days before this event but thankfully it wasn't fatal. Owen gets suplexed and he takes a knee drop afterwards. Owen fights back in the corner and he tries to regain his momentum but Triple H gets a boot up and the Blackheart takes a DDT. Triple H then begins focusing on the injured ankle and I should point out here too that we can hear wrestler communication pretty well at this show. Must be the way the ring's been mic'd up but you can hear multiple calls in this match. We can see Owen's got a small cut on the bridge of his nose as Triple H twists the ankle on the mat. Triple H is going to keep his offense focused on the injured body part as China watches on from the outside. Owen gets a break and he manages to smash Triple H's little king of kings on the ring post and he performs a missile dropkick immediately afterwards. China's now eager to help Hunter out as Owen delivers a belly to belly suplex and a spinning wheel kick, but there's nothing she can do. The flare corner bump doesn't look too great here, but Owen keeps the pressure on with an enziguri, a move that also hurts the Blackheart. Triple H counters another Hurricane Rana attempt with a power bomb, but Hart shakes it off and he pulls off a diving crossbody. Hunter counters an Irish whip though and he goes for a pedigree. Owen counters with a sharpshooter attempt. Triple H kicks Owen away, but more little King of King abuse takes place when Owen falls on Hunter. Triple H goes for another pedigree, Owen backdrops him, Hunter tries a roll up but Owen reverses again. We see the sharpshooter, the crowd get the loudest they've been all night so far and it looks like it's all over for the champ. But Sergeant Slaughter does a terrible job of keeping China away from the match and she's able to assist Hunter. The game gets his hand on the bottom rope and Owen has to let go of the sharpshooter. China then throws a handful of HBK's white powder at Slaughter, what a waste of money that was. She then distracts Owen and she's able to hit Hart with a low blow. Triple H performs the pedigree and Triple H retains the European Championship. China attacks Slaughter on the outside after a referee frees her from the handcuffs. 
And I remember looking forward to this match and not thinking much of it back then, and still today, it isn't all that great. Two awesome talents without a doubt, but there's just not a whole lot to see here. Still though, Triple H has lived up to his end of the bargain in this X-rated WrestleMania. Now Shawn Michaels has to do the same in the main event. We've got a mixed tag team match next, Luna and Goldust vs Mark Merrow in Sable. Sable's been given a ton of TV time leading up to this match, including segments that ended Raw's war, and fans have been reacting very favourably to Merrow's wife, so this one did have some anticipation back in 1998. Fans wanted to see what Sable could actually do in the ring. Jerry Lawler, meanwhile, was more concerned about what Sable would wear to the ring. Mero and Sable have had issues heading into this one of course, but they'll have to work together to get that all important WrestleMania victory. Goldust had reverted back to wearing his classic gold attire on Raw, but at WrestleMania he's wearing red and black face paint. Sable and Mero walk down to the ring and Sable looks ready to go, but as expected, it's Goldust and Marvelous Mark who do most of the heavy lifting here. Mero performs a head scissors followed by a clothesline, Goldust then goes to the wrong corner when trying to tag out, Luna comes in and Mero makes the crowd pop by pointing at Sable. You can tell through this match that Mero was excited to tag with his wife by the way. Sable chases Luna around the ring and Luna tags out again, the crowd boos but they're building up to the physicality between the women quite well I think, all things considered. Sable ends up coming in to hit Goldust with a kick and it can't be understated how much the audience loves Sable here, the pop was just as good as anything in the Owen vs Triple H match. Sable wants Luna of course, but Luna's refusing to get in the ring. Sable's forced to tag out again after Mero just tagged her in, and yes, the way this is laid out is also totally killing the men in the ring. Fans don't want to see Mero vs Goldust. Mark performs a crossbody and the two collide into each other afterwards. The men tag out, Sable and Luna get in, and the roof comes off the Boston Fleet Center when Sable performs a double leg takedown. The two get up and Sable lays in a few corner kicks before tossing Luna across the ring by her hair, Goldust takes a forearm shot by Mrs. Mero too, and Luna gets clotheslined over the top rope. Luna tags out and again Sable has no issues hitting Goldust but the referee forces a tag and Mero takes Goldust out on the outside. Goldust is way too focused on Sable though back in the ring and this leads to Mark hitting a low blow before setting Goldust up for a TKO, though Goldust counters with a sweet DDT. Mark's able to counter the curtain call and Goldust takes a knee lift. We then see a Mero salt, something we haven't seen in a long time, and it looks like Mero hit his head on the canvas, but slow it down and you'll see Goldust had him protected even if the landing was a bit rough. Mero's on fire here, he pulls off a top rope Frankensteiner and when Luna tries to distract him from the apron he manages to move out of the way and Goldust runs into his partner. Mero pulls off the TKO, Luna breaks up the cover before jumping on Mark's back, Mero goes back to his corner and Sable tags in. Sable covers Goldust but the referee's distracted. Luna goes to the top rope but Sable moves out of the way and Luna lands on Goldust. Sable then pulls off a power bomb. this would become known as the Sable Bomb and the crowd again blow the roof off the arena when Sable performed the move. Luna fights back for a moment but she doesn't do anything substantial. The match comes to an end when Sable performs a TKO on Luna. It's not much to look at nowadays, but back then I think this one exceeded expectations. It is a shame that Luna didn't do much from bell to bell, but the match was specifically designed for Sable and in that regards it worked out really well. Mero wants his wife to celebrate, although it looks like Sable doesn't want to. And there you have it, just keep your expectations in check when watching this one. Tennessee leaves at WrestleMania after helping Steve Blackman fight off a giant robot monster on Raw, don't ask, and he introduces Jeff Jarrett and Jennifer Flores to the ring, Jennifer's the special guest ring announcer for this match, Double J doesn't have a match tonight so he can be a valet for a ring announcer. Jared asks Jennifer if he's great, Jennifer says she's been around greatness and she can tell that Double J is indeed great. Jennifer announces the competitors for our next match, it's IC champion The Rock vs challenger Ken Shamrock. These two showed they had amazing chemistry back in their Survivor Series match at Survivor Series 1997, and they also had a great match at the Royal Rumble. Rock outsmarted Kenny Boy by sticking a pair of brass nuts in his trunks and pretty much framing the world's most dangerous man, so Ken seeking both revenge and the IC title at WrestleMania. Just two weeks ago we saw that chair shot on Raw, the week after Rock exited 
accidentally hit the nation's leader Farouk with a chair shot, and Farouk does not come down to the ring with Rock and the rest of the nation at WrestleMania. Shamrock dashes to the ring and he immediately goes on offense. Rock gets taken down with a kick from the world's most dangerous man, and Shamrock clotheslines the IC champ out of the ring. Rock decides he's gonna walk out of WrestleMania, but Shamrock gives chase and we have a fight on the entranceway. Shamrock runs back to break the count and the two go at it again, but Rock fights back this time. Still though, the champ gets his head smashed on the steps before the match resumes in the ring. Shamrock explodes out of the corner with a clothesline. Rock takes a hook kick and Shamrock mounts Rock for a few punches. The match spills to the outside again where Shamrock gets whipped into those steps and back inside the ropes Rock pulls off the people's elbow. Shamrock kicks out at two. It's back to the outside where Shamrock lands a clothesline and then his temper gets the better of him. He grabs a steel chair and the referee tries to take it away. The chair ends up at Rock's feet when Shamrock shoves the ref and Kenny Boy pays dearly with a chair shot to the face. Anyone else would have stayed down, Ken Shamrock kicks out a two. Shamrock enters his zone and it's all over for the rock. We see a back elbow, a jumping leg lariat and a power slam. Ken then performs the belly to belly while a replay of the chair shot gets shown and the rock then tops out to the ankle lock. Ken Shamrock wins the match. Dilo and Kama get in the ring and they too take belly to belly suplexes. Shamrock tries to put the ankle lock on again but Mark Henry gets in the ring and so the world's strongest man also gets suplexed. The new IC champ then goes back to put the ankle lock on Rocky but then Farouk runs down to the ring. The nation's leader remembers how Rock's been acting as of late and he remembers the chair shot on Raw, so Farouk decides he's gonna let Rock work this one out for himself and Farouk walks away without offering any help. Shamrock will not let go of the ankle lock. A bunch of officials we have never seen before and Pat Patterson force Shamrock to break the hold, but Kenny Boy ends up suplexing everyone except Patterson. Rock gets put on a stretcher as the regular officials hit the ring, and then it's announced that the decision has been reversed. Due to Ken's actions after the bell, the referees decided to award the match to Rocky, and The Rock is still the IC champion. Ken loses it and he throws Rock off the stretcher beside the entranceway. The two fight on DX's stage and Rock takes a body slam. Shamrock throws Rock off the bandstand and he lifts the IC title before throwing it on top of Rocky. Again, it's a decent match, but it's also short and I thought their match at the Royal Rumble was a little better. The crowd did love Ken Shamrock on this night though and the reaction was on the money. The tag team title dumpster match is up next and this all began when the outlaws pushed Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie off the raw stage while inside a dumpster. Since then, the two teams have had a little back and forth and as I talked about last week, it's good to see the tag team titles getting featured a bit more prominently. The object of this match is to put a team inside a dumpster sitting at ringside and the winners will become the new tag team champions. It's very straightforward. The challengers bring some toys to the match and it looks like Chainsaw Charlie's gone for the evening and we've got Terry Funk instead. The fight starts off on the outside with Funk fighting Billy and Cactus taking care of Road Dog. Billy and Funk try to get in the ring as Cactus hits Road Dog with a running knee beside the dumpster and James answers this with a tray to Jack's face. Gunn hits his own partner with a baseball slide so he doesn't take an apron sent on from Cactus Jack and the outlaws manage to throw Funk into the guardrail. Terry then gets backdropped into the dumpster while Road Dog performs a side rushing leg sweep on Foley. Funk gets out but this allows the outlaws to set the challengers up for a few hits with the dumpster lids and then both Cactus and Terry get put inside that dumpster. Billy Gunn closes his lid, he thinks it's all over but Mick Foley pops up and Road Dog takes the mandible claw. Gunn has to move quickly to save his partner but Badass takes a claw too. A trade shot ends up sorting Cactus out but Terry Funk reappears and Gunn then gets taken out. The match goes into the ring where Road Dog takes a Cactus Jack swinging neckbreaker. Funk does even more damage to Road Dog's neck. Cactus jumps off the apron and Gunn gets whacked with a tray and then Cactus brings a ladder into the match. Cactus climbs up the ladder but Billy Gunn meets him at the top. Funk then falls into that ladder and we see a great bump when Billy and Jack go into the dumpster. After both men climb out, the outlaws work together to powerbomb Funk into the dumpster resulting in another great looking spot but now the champs need to get Cactus 
this back in there. So Road Dog and Badass go after Foley, but they end up fighting all the way up the ramp and we go to the backstage area. Cactus gets destroyed here at first with the outlaws using everything at their disposal to do damage. They use Cactus as a human bowling ball to knock over some conveniently placed oversized parade bottles, but Cactus comes back with chair shots for both Road Dog and Billy Gunn. Cactus Jack hits Billy Gunn with a double arm DDT on a wooden pallet. Terry Funk is shown up and he's behind the wheel of the forklift the pallet sits on. Road Dog gets put on top of Gunn and the pallet gets brought over to another dumpster that sits backstage. The outlaws get dropped in and Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie win the tag team championships. This one was fun but I can't remember it being so short. There were some great looking bumps in the match that involved the dumpster but I had it in my head that a lot more happened in this bout. Still though, it was pretty good and the fans seem happy that we have new WWF Tag Team Champions. The Undertaker's little brother showed up at Bad Blood in your house all the way back in October 1997, and since then Kane has caused the dead man nothing but problems. Undertaker refused to fight his brother, so Kane and Paul Bear went on a path of destruction, destroying everyone in Kane's path until The Undertaker agreed to fight. Taker made it clear he wouldn't fight his own flesh and blood, and so Kane and Bear came up with a plan to remove Taker from WWF for good. Kane would back Taker up and pretend to be on The Undertaker's side. Fans thought the brothers were on good terms, but at the Royal Rumble, everyone found out that Kane still wanted to take his brother out, and indeed, The Undertaker got taken out in dramatic fashion. The Phenom was locked in a casket and the casket was set on fire. Bear and Kane thought that The Undertaker was gone forever, but just weeks before Mania, The Undertaker returned and he announced that he would fight his brother at WrestleMania. We even saw The Undertaker speak to his parents' gravestones to ask for forgiveness while saying he's at peace with living in eternal damnation for what he's gonna do at WrestleMania. So here we go, a highly anticipated match at WrestleMania 14. Pete Rose, formerly of the Cincinnati Reds, is our special guest ring announcer and he gets a little heat by ripping into the Red Sox. He does pretty well here actually and he doesn't care about getting booed out of the building. Kane comes to the ring a little early though and the big red machine tombstones Pete Rose and the crowd lose their minds. This right here would become a mania moment but do keep in mind that Kane got a baby face pop after doing this move. Still though, the crowd are loyal to the dead man. The Undertaker gets a spectacular entrance that includes torch carrying broods, and you can sense a whole lot of excitement as The Undertaker makes his in ring return to face his little brother live at WrestleMania 14. The Undertaker squares up to Kane and Jim Ross wonders if Taker's still reluctant to go through with this. The Phenom's first to strike though and the punches don't have much effect on Kane but still Taker stays on his little brother and he pushes him back into the corner. Kane comes back with a back elbow, the two counter each other as they fight corner to corner but the dead man's first off his feet after a short arm clothesline. Taker sits right back up but Kane catches his older brother when Taker tries a crossbody. Kane brings Taker to the corner and he tries to put him in the tree of woe but Taker's way too big, so Kane just lays the boots in and he chokes The Undertaker instead. Jim Ross says he's never seen The Undertaker get overwhelmed like this as Kane lays in the right hands, and the Phenom takes a few hard Irish whips while getting sent from pillar to post. Kane drops the dead man on the top ring rope before hitting him with a diving punch, and the devil's favourite demon then allows Undertaker to crawl back in the ring for even more punishment. Taker has to put his hands up in the corner trying to protect himself from Kane's onslaught. Taker runs at Kane and he jumps on his shoulders showing some great agility, but unfortunately the reverse electric chair drop afterwards didn't look too hot, it was a good effort though. The fight moves to the outside where Taker gets dropped on the guardrail and thrown into the ring steps. Paul Bear then distracts the referee and this allows Kane to lift those same steps and drop them across Taker's back. 
Kane then drops the steps over Taker's leg before he gets back in the ring, and then Paul Bear gets in a few cheap shots while the dead man's trying to recover. Kane suplexes his brother back into the ring, and Taker once again covers up while in the corner. Taker's never been a defensive wrestler, so it's kinda interesting seeing this. Undertaker tries to launch out of the corner with a clothesline, but again, it doesn't have much effect on the big red machine, and when Taker tries to mount some offense from an Irish whip, he ends up getting chokeslammed. This is clearly not going well for the Phenom at all. Kane breaks his own pin so he can dish out further punishment. Shit gets serious when Kane applies a chin lock, and the Phenom's gonna have to dig deep to get out of this one. The crowd starts booing when the hold stays in a little too long, but this crowd doesn't know what good wrestling is. Undertaker breaks free with a ton of quick body shots, but he goes straight back down after a clothesline. Kane performs an elbow drop, and I'm not sure if Kane didn't read the audience here because he applies another chin lock, and the crowd don't react to it very well at all, of course. To free himself, Taker drops Kane on the top rope, and the big red machine ends up on the outside. The crowd then seriously wake up when Taker dives over the ropes, but Kane sees a coming and the Phenom goes through the Spanish announce table. Check out Hugo Savanovich's cell job afterwards, it's so dramatic. Kane throws a piece of the table on top of Taker and the dead man isn't given much time to recover. Kane throws Taker back inside the ropes and the dead man takes the signature diving clothesline, and Taker again has to try to defend himself from more punches. Taker gets a chance to tombstone Kane after ducking a clothesline, but Kane counters it and the dead man gets planted. The crowd thinks it's all over, but The Undertaker kicks out at two. Kane can't believe it. A flurry of Undertaker punches stun Kane as Jim Ross wonders if Kane's now tired after delivering all that offense. The big red machine then goes down after a clothesline, we see a chokeslam from The Undertaker, and Kane lands on his head after taking a tombstone pile driver. Somehow though, Kane kicks out and the crowd goes into a frenzy. So, Taker hits a leg drop, another tombstone, and again, the big red machine won't stay down. Finally, a diving clothesline from the Phenom, followed by a third tombstone pile driver, ends the match, and Taker wins via pinfall. The Undertaker has defeated his little brother at WrestleMania, but the war is far from over. Paul Bear grabs a steel chair and he slides it over to Kane. Undertaker gets attacked by Paul, but Taker gets himself up and Paul gets wiped out with a right hand. Problem is, the Undertaker is so fatigued that he crumbles to the mat afterwards, and Kane now has a free shot. The Phenom takes a chair shot across the back and Kane tombstones the Undertaker on that same chair. So clearly, this is a rivalry that's going to continue on, and that just makes perfect sense. I don't think anyone expected it to end right here, though according to Bruce Pritchard, the Kane character was originally only going to last to WrestleMania 14 before getting written off. The character had gotten over so well in the run up to Mania that the decision was made to keep Kane around apparently, and you would have been stupid to ask this character after all that time and effort that was put in during the Path of Destruction. I know people speak highly of this match, and it is a spectacle for sure, but it's not my favourite Taker and Kane bout. Things get a bit more aggressive as the months go on, and we've got all that to look forward to in Reliving the War. Also, it's a bit hard to make out here, but Taker had the letters EH on his right arm for Earl Hebner during this match. Shawn Michaels vs Stone Cold Steve Austin isn't a story about a rivalry, it's about Austin's journey to the WWF Championship. His feud with Bret Hart made people take notice. He had gotten extremely popular as fans started favouring the anti-heroes while rejecting the more typical babyfaces the WWF would present. When Bret and the Hart Foundation left, Austin feuded with The Rock over the IC belt, but Stone Cold made it clear that he had bigger fish to fry, even going as far as to forfeit the IC title in order to compete for the WWF title. And Austin's goal became a reality when he won the 1998 Royal Rumble, earning him a shot at Shawn Michaels' WWF Championship in the WrestleMania main event. Shawn Michaels, meanwhile, has been going through a ton of turbulence that went into overdrive following a back injury. Shawn's scheduled matches were cancelled following his casket match against The Undertaker at the Rumble, and Shawn was in a real bad place while on the road to WrestleMania. The back injury would ultimately lead to Shawn making the decision to step away from the ring and retire for good, but he had to drop the belt in this WrestleMania match. It's been reported that things were touch and go in the weeks leading up to Mania, and there were worries about Shawn being Shawn and refusing to work the match, but he got there in the end and he'd end up having this match while in a lot of clearly visible pain. 
It was said that Undertaker was sitting in Gorilla taping his fists before the entrances, sending a message that Sean better do what's best for WWF and do the job as intended. For years Michaels didn't know about this and he even asked Taker about it and Taker jokingly said it didn't happen, but on Steve Austin's Broken Skull sessions, Taker did indeed confirm that he was on standby if the match didn't go as planned, so that gives us an example of how serious this was. Let's not forget about Mike Tyson either, Tyson was a big deal back in the 90s and his involvement in this main event got a lot of press attention. In storyline, Tyson would join D-Generation X after he felt disrespected by Austin during Mike's first Raw appearance, so the odds are firmly stacked against Stone Cold tonight from a storyline perspective. This is a fascinating match for sure and one that I don't think gets talked about enough. Michaels being so insufferable during this time period completely takes away from the fact that he worked this match while dealing with a career threatening injury. The dirt sheet worthy stories of Sean possibly not wanting to do business in his personal and professional downward spiral completely takes away from the fact that a legend of the business was about to have what he thought was his final match and the WWF were about to lose a guy who, I think, was the best in ring performer they had left. Times were changing, the guys at the top of the cards were changing, and this WrestleMania main event would usher in a new era for the WWF that would quickly lead to Raw beating WCW Nitro in the weekly television ratings. So let's check out the WrestleMania 14 main event, Shawn Michaels vs Stone Cold Steve Austin. Mike Tyson comes out to the ring first and he doesn't get a great ovation. The crowd boo the newest member of D-Generation X as he gets ready to be the special enforcer for this matchup. We see Steve Austin walking backstage and the crowd pops. The glass shatters and the fleet center goes into a frenzy. Stone Cold makes his way to the ring to make history. He and Tyson share words in the ring and things get a little heated, but it does look like Tyson's having fun in there. The audience aren't burnt out and they aren't tired, they're hyped up for this WrestleMania main event. We see HBK walking backstage along with Hunter in China, and Sean looks uncharacteristically nervous, all things considered who could blame him. He says this one's for you Earl as he gets ready to walk into the arena, and then Chris Warren and the DX band begin playing the D-Generation X theme song. It's remarkable how Sean's demeanour changes when he steps out into the arena. He went from looking a bit nervous to looking absolutely pumped up and in a way, he looks like he's got a chip on his shoulder, he looks angry and he looks too ready. This is one of my favourite Shawn Michaels entrances because it's so different than the usual dancing and showman stuff that we're used to. It's like he knows this is it, yet he knows this shouldn't be it, he's still the man. The dust settles, Tyson takes his place on the outside, the bell rings and Sean starts messing around with Austin. He's prancing around the ring and being an asshole so Steve Austin flips him off, this gets a great pop from the audience. Sean's able to stick Austin twice to start things off, Austin gets frustrated so he chases Sean out of the ring. When the two get back inside, HBK takes a forearm shot to the head and then Sean gets sent from pillar to post while getting his head rammed into the top turnbuckles. Austin has to pull HBK back into the ring by his tights and Stone Cold continues to attack while HBK's bare ass hangs out. Austin backdrops HBK out of the ring and Hunter doesn't do much to break the fall. Sean lands on his back and Triple H is gonna buy Sean some time by attacking Austin on the outside. Stone Cold gets thrown into the guardrail and so Mike Kyoto orders Triple H and China to leave the ringside area and head to the back. Austin attacks Triple H near the entranceway, but Michaels follows. Austin gets taken out with a symbol, and HBK throws Austin into the side of the dumpster from earlier on. The two head back to the ring where Austin counters a flying double axe handle, and then Sean, for whatever reason, tries the upside down corner bump and he takes it with more impact than ever before. This spot right here wrecks HBK. He takes an inverted atomic drop afterwards and he just falls on his back. You can then see the pain on his face when he tries to sit back up. The crowd remain firmly in Austin's corner as he applies a wrist lock. He drops Michaels over the top rope as an Austin champ breaks out. Sean manages to dodge a stunner but he gets punched off the apron and he lands on the announce desk. Sean gets sent into the ring steps and Austin drops a few elbows on Michaels while he's draped over the apron. Michaels takes another elbow drop inside the ring and Stone Cold then applies a chin lock. 
A jawbreaker from Michaels breaks the hold. HBK grimaces as he drags Austin's legs to the ring post, but it's HBK who takes a bump here. Austin goes out and the two fight at the guardrails, but Austin ends up taking a backdrop into the audience and Sean follows this up with a ring bell shot. Back in the ring, Sean lays in the punches while Austin's on the mat, but Sean seriously slowed down here, and it makes you wonder how much longer this can really go on for. The crowd chant Holyfield as Michaels jabs Austin in the corner. Sean performs a snap mare followed by more punches, and in between offense, Sean flips off the audience, making Austin's takedown afterwards get an insanely good reaction. Sean gets thrown over the top rope, but he manages to grab Austin's leg, and the ring post comes into play again. Sean targets the knee over and over again and this continues inside the ropes, but Sean's having difficulty staying on his opponent. He tries drilling Austin's knee into the mat over and over again and Austin buys him some time by taking a baseball slide that sends Stone Cold into the announce desk. Mike Tyson ends up throwing Stone Cold back inside the ropes and fans aren't too happy that Tyson put his hands on Austin. Sean performs a chop lock and then he locks in a figure 4. Austin manages to reverse the pressure, the move gets broken up, and Stone Cold performs a catapult that only gets him a 2 count. HBK then applies a sleeper and the referee takes a bump when Austin pushes Sean into the corner. Austin keeps the pressure on though as Jerry Lawler says Tyson needs to get in the ring and take over. Sean takes a back body drop but he answers with a forearm, not looking nearly as good as it usually does. Sean then goes to the top rope and he has to psych himself up a little before jumping off with an elbow drop, but he pulls it off and he says that's it, time for sweet chin music. Sean warms up the band, Austin ducks the super kick, Sean counters a stunner with another super kick attempt, but Austin grabs the foot and we see that stone cold stunner. Tyson gets in the ring, he counts HBK's shoulders to the mat, and the Austin era begins as Stone Cold becomes WWF Champion. Tyson's count was a little fast, but let's not take away from the moment. Stone Cold Steve Austin had finally achieved his goal of becoming WWF Champ and the fans are going crazy. Michaels wakes up and he wants to know what the hell Tyson's thinking. Sean decides he's gonna knock Tyson out, but that doesn't work out too well of course. Sean gets KO'd in the middle of the ring, and Tyson drapes an Austin 316 shirt over Michaels, something HBK wanted written out of the script apparently. The crowd are now huge Mike Tyson fans, there's a big old celebration inside the arena, and Austin leaves with Tyson and the WWF Championship while HBK prepares for retirement. The match, of course, could have been a lot better, but given the circumstances, I don't think you could ask for more really. Not a great WrestleMania main event, but an important WrestleMania main event. This event felt way more like WrestleMania compared to the effort in 1997, but honestly, I think it's just decent and nothing more. The pieces of the puzzle are certainly in place when the show goes off the air, and it's a landmark show in terms of the Attitude Era, but I don't really think any of the matches are absolute must-see showcases. In terms of bell-to-bell -bell action, I'd actually say that WCW's Uncensored 98 was a better show, but WrestleMania still felt like a way bigger deal thanks to the excellent build-up to the event and the effort WWF put into the production. The main event is worth watching for Stone Cold and Shawn Michaels fans because it's a beginning and an end. The Kane vs Taker match is also worth watching for those studying the Brothers of Destruction, but I think there's better WrestleManias out there for sure, and I also think WWF put on better pay-per-views as 1998 continues on. But let me know what you thought of WrestleMania 14, and I hope to see you next Thursday where we'll check out the Raw after Mania on Reliving the War. Some big stuff goes down that you don't want to miss. Thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed this one and take care.